Grace and peace, and welcome to Eastminster Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you could uh, join us this morning and worship in the sanctuary, as well as all those uh, folks that are joining us online. Uh, if you could please take a moment to pass the pew pad located along the center aisle, uh, taking note of who's worshiping beside you. Maybe you can send them a little note um, in that pew pad. Uh, a couple announcements of the body. Um, Lots going on. If you're looking at uh, the bulletin, uh, we're still, we're doing the um, photo directory. The photos for that are happening next uh, week. And if you haven't signed up to get your picture taken, Bethany, am I correct? They can still sign up. I am correct. Okay. Um, you can still sign up. So if you didn't do that yet, for some reason, you can still uh, do that. Also, a uh, couple things, other things. Rise Against Hunger, uh, October 30th, great uh, ministry to participate in, uh, filling uh, food bags uh, for those that um, are hungry. Those will be shipped around the world, um, and uh, we'll be able to uh, feed folks around the world through that ministry. Uh, Thanksgiving food cards, um, and then a couple uh, notes from uh, the vision team. The family vision team is working on the... So that is October 29th from 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, so far, the whole preschool has been invited. Eyes Elementary School has been invited. So we're hoping that we have a few kids. We have to make sure we have trunks here, though, and candy. Because um, otherwise, it's going to be a little rough. Um, so if you're able to do that, if you want to participate in that, it'll be a great time uh, to spend some uh, time with the community. The dive team, another part of the vision uh, community, is offering a book study. Uh, the, the book they're studying is White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. Uh, this will be a six-week study starting October uh, 25th. It is limited to uh, 10 folks to sign up for that. If you're interested in that, there's information about how to sign up for that in the bulletin. Uh, let us come together as the body of Christ. And let us worship God as one. Please join with me in the responsive call to worship. We lift up our eyes to the hills. From where will our help come? Our help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. In praise and thanksgiving, we gather as one body, with song and with prayer. The Lord will keep our going out and our coming in from this time and forevermore. Come, let us worship God.
The word of God, Jesus Christ, leads the way to salvation through faith. In turning to the Lord with humility and trusting in his love, we confess together our sin and the sin of the world. Grace-filled God, we confess that we pursue our own needs, neglecting the needs of others. We pursue our own desires while slowly destroying the gifts of your creation. We deflect the call to ministry, ignoring the cries of those in need. We are drawn to proclaim the gospel, yet live it out only at our convenience. Have mercy on us, O God. Open our eyes to the truth of the gospel, that whatever the time or wherever we are, we may fully embody your love and justice for all the world. Whoever we are, wherever we are, however we are, we belong to God. Through Jesus Christ, God cleanses us from unrighteousness that leads us from sin. People of God, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you. Please turn and share that peace with those around you. Peace, Randy. Reading from Genesis chapter 32. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint. He wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans, and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed, limping because of his hip. Oh, 
Reading from Luke chapter 18. Jesus told the disciples this parable about their need to pray always and not lose heart. Jesus said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In the city, there was a widow who kept coming to the judge and saying, grant me justice against my accuser. For a while, the judge refused. But later on, he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, Yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to those chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, God will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, illumine our hearts that the words of your Spirit might be spoken through your word might be sung through songs and might be proclaimed. Yet we might hear the message that you have for us as a body of Christ. All for the sake of Jesus Christ. The word made flesh. Amen. I was uh, joking with Randy earlier that it was actually a little bit difficult to start this sermon this morning. You see, we're, the introduction is about public corruption, and it was hard to figure out which story to even highlight. Many of us might have seen the recent story coming out of Mississippi, the public corruption scandal. It starts off like a bad joke. You have a governor, a nonprofit leader, and a franchise quarterback in Brett Favre. And a volleyball stadium gets built with welfare money. About $5 million suddenly got reallocated and disappears. Or the recent case that some of you might have read about, about a 17-year-old named Piper Lewis, She's a child in Iowa. She was trafficked, and she eventually fought back against her attacker. She killed her attacker. She admits to that readily. Yet, she was ordered to pay $150,000 in restitution to the family of her attacker. The judge said he had no other option in that moment. That is the law of the land in Iowa if you have a manslaughter case. It was a debt that was required by law. A debt for a 17-year-old who was a victim of trafficking who, prior to being trafficked, was unhoused. She was escaping an abusive home who did not have a support system around her to care for her, a debt that would be insurmountable. You read headlines like this, and you are left wondering, What is justice? Where is there justice in these situations? The fact that they're even talked about clearly, though, says we are a society that does believe in laws, and we're trying to hold people accountable. But it's sad, and it can cause you to grieve 
the parable we're talking about this morning, Jesus begins with the topic. He says, I want to teach the disciples, I'm teaching the disciples, that we must pray. We must pray and not lose heart. He is in this moment preparing them for his death. He's on that road starting to head towards Jerusalem in the book of Luke so that they are ready to know that Jesus is going to die. And he's trying to teach them to be prepared to pray, to know that life may not always match what we long for, but we should still pray to God. The parable begins with a description of this judge. This is a judge who neither fears God nor respects people. What Jesus in this moment is doing is he is essentially calling this judge a fool. The book of Proverbs tells us the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. That if we have wisdom, we fear God. And so what he is saying in this moment is this character does not even fear God. Therefore, he has no wisdom. He is without wisdom. He is a fool. So this judge is already set up in negative light. The widow keeps approaching him and asking him for for justice. We don't know the situation that this widow is facing. It could have been a land dispute. It could have been an inheritance dispute. It could have been any number of things. But what we know is she continues to approach this judge asking for justice. This would have been a tribal justice system Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about some Roman system. He's talking about a local judge that we might read about in the book of Judges. These type of local tribal leaders that would dispense justice for their community. But that's what she is longing for. She wants justice. And what we know about this woman is that the fact that she is a widow means she is already vulnerable. This is a society that is extremely patriarchal. A society in which women walked seven steps behind their husbands because they could not walk next to them. And she is suddenly without any form of income. And what we know from the parable and the way Jesus describes this character is she's not only vulnerable, she's doubly vulnerable. Because what we see is we don't see a male heir, somebody else in her family, approaching this judge. So what we know from this story, this parable, this teaching, is that there are no men left in her family. She is left to literally fend for herself. And so she is approaching this judge, demanding justice, pleading her case, And the teaching of Judaism is very clear. There is an emphasis on care for those in the margins, and there is an emphasis on care for widows. Deuteronomy chapter 24 says, you shall not pervert the justice due to an immigrant, the fatherless, or take a widow's garment in pledge. If you do that, you are cursed. Rendering justice for a widow in Hebrew scriptures, is an understanding of fulfilling the covenant, that you are doing what God is asking you to do. So you care for a widow, you are doing what God is asking you to do. And it becomes the symbol of one of the most marginalized people in this society. The psalmist depicts God as a judge who seeks to help widows, a father to the fatherless, a defender of the widows, is God in God's holy dwelling. But what's so fascinating about the way Jesus sets up this parable is this widow in this story is no shrinking violet. She has agency and she has authority in a society where she shouldn't have had one. She's walking up to this man demanding justice. She is challenging what she sees as corruption because she's not getting what she needs and wants and deserves in her society. And that's what she's doing. 
The judge, in this case, he's concerned about losing face, about being publicly humiliated by this widow, by this woman. And we hear that in his internal dialogue, repeating again that he has no fear for God and no respect for people. Again, reminding us who is this judge, what is the quality of character that he is living out. And he says, I will grant her justice so she'll stop bothering me. She may wear me out if she keeps coming day after day. And you can picture this routine. Maybe she's stopping him on the street. Maybe she's yelling to him in the marketplace, demanding justice, demanding what she needs. But what's interesting in here, and we don't see this in the English translation, is there's actually a joke that Jesus buries in here. The literal translation of this is, I will grant her justice so she doesn't give me a black eye. So she doesn't punch me in the face. So she doesn't slap me. This woman feels empowered in this moment. And it's the threat of humiliation that pushes, pushes this judge over the edge. It says, I will grant you justice. Jesus steps out of the parable asking the question, will God not grant you justice if you cry out day and night? What we know from scripture is justice is not a narrowly defined legal standing. What it is, when we describe this in scripture, it is a state of harmony. It's a state of harmony that we are living in. It's a state of harmony that we are living in in, in God's word and in God's world. That all people, to experience justice, all people are flourishing. It is a state in which all people are flourishing. Righteousness, there's a word that you might see pop up often in English translations. Righteousness and justice are actually the same root of the word. They come from the same place. But it's all this idea that we need to be in harmony with God. We need to be in harmony with one another that people need to be able to flourish. Yet Jesus is talking about prayer. So what is he saying to us here about prayer? Reassuring us that God hears us when we pray, that God is listening to those in need, pointing to the character of God, saying that God will hear them. But I think what God, is, I think what is being pointed to in this is two forms of prayer. Prayer with our hearts and prayer with our feet, with our hands and our feet. Prayer with our hearts and prayer with our hands and our feet. That when we pray, when we spend time with God, when we have relationship with God, it should waken a new reality in our lives. That we should be moved by that. The theologian Dorothea Soleil said that prayer should not, should lead not to a new vision of God, but a relationship to the world one that has borrowed the eyes of God. That when we pray, we should be borrowing the eyes of God. That we should see and view the way the world, the way God views the world. That when we pray, that prayer should cause us to open our eyes and see what is happening in the world, not to turn from hardship, not to turn from division, not to turn from injustice, but to lean into it, to demonstrate a better way. This is the call to hands and feet prayer, that we need to be the answer to somebody's prayer. 
that all those people that are crying out, (laughs) as the people of God, we need to respond. That we need to see all people flourish. That we need to put other folks ahead of ourselves. The Scottish poet James Montgomery understood this type of prayer. He was born in 1771. His life was shaped by the church. He was the firstborn son of Reverend John Montgomery. And James, after he grew up, he was really struggling to figure out what to do with his life. He dropped out of school several times, tried several different careers, once working in a general store, but he could never figure out what to do. He eventually found what he was called to do in lyrical poetry. He began writing poem after poem. And these lyrics, over 400 of them, have been turned into hymns. One that you might know is go to dark Gethsemane. But what really stands out about his life was what happened to him. He was actually jailed and arrested twice for hymns that he wrote. They were considered that controversial that he was advocating for people on the margins that he was actually arrested by the English government. He spoke out against slavery. He protested against slavery before it was even banned in the U.S. or Great Britain. And he understood that form of prayer, that connecting to God in relationships helps us to see the world in a new way, that we should borrow God's eyes, that we should long for justice for all people to flourish. I'm going to close in prayer with the lyrics from one of his hymns. It's called, Lord, teach us to pray aright. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, teach us how to pray aright. With reverence and with fear, though dust and ashes in thy sight We may, we must draw near. We perish if we cease from prayer. O grant us power to pray. And when to meet thee we prepare, Lord, meet us by the way. God of all grace, we come to thee with broken, contrite hearts. Give what thine eyes delight to see, truth in the inward parts. Faith is the only sacrifice that can for sin atone to cast our hopes, to fix our eyes on Christ, on Christ alone. Patience to watch and wait and weep, though mercy long delay. Courage our fainting souls to keep and trust thee thou slay. Give these and then thy will be done. Thus strengthen with all might We, through thy spirit and thy son, shall pray and pray aright. Amen.
Let us remain standing as we affirm our faith together by reading the passage from Colossians. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the faithfulness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Amen. Please be seated. With gratitude for God's faithfulness and with thanksgiving for all that we have received, let us offer our gifts and our lives to God. God, with faith and hope, we offer these gifts to you. Use them to accomplish your purposes in Jesus Christ, the head of the church and the Lord of our lives. We pray that in the name of Christ. Amen. Please be seated.
One of the things that I always say is that I get to work with the best staff. Um, it's always a joy to come into work and spend time here with, with Randy and Beth Ann and, and Carly and Dave. And this morning, I'm excited to share with you. We're getting an update um, from Carly Kearns, our preschool director. She shared uh, with the uh, congregation at the first service a little things that are happening within uh, the preschool. And Amy, the assistant director, was here as well at the earlier service. So if we could have a round of applause for Car Carly. Carly also confessed to me that her favorite thing is to stand in front of people and uh, speak with a microphone. And so when she told me that, I was more than willing to have her uh, get up here and share a little bit about all the awesome things happening in our church preschool. So I, I do want to start by thanking all of you for your support. Um, having the preschool be a part of our community is so important to us, and, and it starts here with our church community. So just put together a little brief so slideshow. It's not too long. Just to tell you a little bit about us and what we've been doing so far this year. So to start, we have 160 students enrolled. We can take up to 174. So Some 14 people... of them can join? Yes. Anybody want to redo yes. preschool? <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> so um, I think some people were surprised. They didn't realize we were that big. We have 10 classrooms, so there's a, a lot going on. Um, we do open registration in January for next year's school year. So if you know of anyone in your neighborhood with young children, just pass that word along that we're opening up in January for new registration. We have a scholarship fund to assist families in need. The money from that scholarship fund comes from um, donations and our fundraisers. So your own missions committee donates every year to our scholarship fund and we do 50% of all of our fundraisers um, also. And we also have some parents, I didn't mention that in the first one, but we do have some parents that donate to our, our scholarship fund. We currently have four families that are receiving aid and are able to have their children at preschool just because of that scholarship fund. And over the summer, we used um, the scholarship fund and some other donations from missions to host some students from East York Elementary School to come to summer camp. So we had, how many kids we had? We had five kids come from East York and two siblings of one of some of the kids. So that was really nice and we're excited to do that again this coming year. So we'll yeah. keep partnering. And that was really a great partnership between uh, the elementary school, uh, the uh, preschool and the church that we were able to do that together. And I was so grateful uh, for Session getting involved and saying this is a priority for us. Yeah. Uh, early education for children. It's one of the best things we can do for the kids in our community. Yeah. Oh, I skipped over it. I went too fast. Okay, oh, that's there okay. we go. Oh, you just wanted to skip that one. I wanted to skip this so, one. No, <laughs> no this, this, um, this past week, we brought back pastor story time. We had a two-year hiatus because of COVID and, and all the changes that were going on, but we brought it back this week, and I thought this was a great picture. I got it shows Josh and Randy, and they look like they're having a lot of fun. Um, we were having a lot of fun. <laughs> Josh read a story called I Am Human. It was all about empathy and being kind to one another, which is something that we try to teach our kiddos every day. And Randy taught them this little light of mine. So we had five classes in here, and tomorrow we're going to do the other five classes. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah, and I made the mistake of telling all 75 at once that if they told me their name once, I'd remember it. <laughs> So now so, they expect that. Yeah, so they expect <laughs> that. I don't know if I'm going to be able to deliver on that one. Um, we, Like I said, we do think that being a part of our community is very important, and we have community resources that come to our school to help us teach the, the kiddos. Um, later on in the year, we'll have the sheriff's department come with the canine dogs. We have a dental health center that comes to teach our children about keeping their teeth healthy. Last month, we had the fire department come in. So you can see here they bring their engines, and the children get to see what's on the trucks. 
And they also dress up in their turnout gear, which is very important because if you can see the guy in the picture, imagine you're a three-year-old, your house is on fire, and this comes crawling across the floor to you. It's a little scary. So this way they get to see them all dressed up in a very safe situation. They can touch everything, ask questions. So it's really important. And York Area United Fire Company, they come every year. They're wonderful. They're so good with our kids. We also go out into our community. Um, just this week, our classes went to Maple Lawn Farms where they got to ride on the hay wagon and pick apples and pumpkins. Then after they're done, they get to play on the hay maze and um, they have a whole play area that the families stay at. Some of them pack lunches and stay for the day. If you haven't ever been there, I suggest going down. That's where the Maze Quest is located. They're wonderful. We've been doing this for a couple of years and we just love this trip. And then finally, when we're not out and about, which is not that often, we're in our classrooms, and that's where we spend the majority of our time. So um, there's, the teachers are very busy. Every week they are preparing hands-on activities that are theme-related that help the children with their skills. We believe that children learn through play. So when they are playing, they are working. You can see in the pictures this little girl is building an apple tree with the blocks. The children up in the top, they're making apple trees with, with whole arm prints, not just hand prints. And down at the bottom, they set up a donut shop, and they were selling donuts. So <laughs> that was a really popular one. <laughs> so we have a lot of fun, and it's busy, and we invite you to come and check us out. And so lastly, just thank you for all of your support. It really does mean a lot to us, and we couldn't do this without all of you. Thank you. As a partnership, this, it, the preschool is just so important to what we do as a church, the way we share the love of God um, through our time together with these preschool kids. And I can tell you just from firsthand experience, my uh, son Charlie went through a half a year preschool program. It was disrupted here because of COVID like everything else. And uh, he absolutely thrived in the half year that he was, uh, got to hang out with Carly and Amy and the gang. So I'm so thankful uh, for them. So transitioning to the prayers of the people, there are several folks that we continue to be in uh, prayer for. And remember, you can submit those prayer concerns by calling or emailing the office or um, dropping a note in the offering plate. We're in, this morning in prayer for Miranda Bowersox, for Baby Journey, for Mary Boyd and her sister Barbara Reinhardt, for Dolores Bradley, Richard Campbell Jr., Jody Geiger, Kay Matunis, Jim May, Alan McIntosh, Lois Moore, Kathy Mount Purcell, Harold Smith, Ron Ziegler, and Charles Gensler. Let us go to God in prayer. Merciful God, powerful and wonderful, eternally present and graciously close to us this day. We are grateful, O oh God, for all that you have given us in Jesus Christ, life and love without end. Prompted by your spirit, encouraged by your faithfulness, we lift together to you the cares and concerns that are on our hearts both those cares and concerns that are spoken and unspoken, the burdens and worries that we care about all of our lives. We pray that the sick would be healed, the broken would be mended, the mourned full would be comforted. And God, this day we pray for several people from our own community and families. We pray for Miranda and Journey, Mary and her sister Barbara as they grieve. Dolores and Richard and Jody and Kay and Jim and Alan and Lois and Kathy and Harold and Ron and Charles. And God, we also lift up to you this day all those students we have listed in the bulletin that are attending college. God, that as they are away from home, that they may be prompted to come back when they are here, that they may know the love 
that surrounds them from this community. And God, this day we pray, we continue to pray. Pray for peace. Pray that leaders would gain wisdom. We pray for those that, are, that need to be consoled. The poor would be lifted up and the anxious would be released from their anxiety. We pray for children in their growing and for youth in their seeking. We pray, oh God, for those making new starts and those nearing life's end. We pray for those facing hard choices, those enduring painful consequences. We pray for those filled with bitterness and those who are just empty. We pray, oh God, that your church might claim its potential, that the body of Christ might be strengthened in its many parts, that the work of ministry might be done with joy and thanksgiving. We pray, O oh God, for the courage to follow Jesus, for the faith to trust your promises to us, for the vision to see your kingdom among us even now. We pray for all that you would have us pray. We pray for those whom no one prays for. We pray the things that, that things, we pray all these things in the name of the one who ceaselessly prays for us, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forevermore, trusting in Christ. We offer the prayer you taught us together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Faith calls us to prayer. Prayer calls us to persistence. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with you now, this day, and evermore. Amen.